The shootout at the OK Corral is perhaps the most classic tale of cops and robbers in the Wild West. In just 30 seconds, 30 rounds were fired when the tension between a crew of thieving cowboys and a vigilante lawman came to an explosive head in the frontier town of Tombstone, Arizona. Yet over a hundred years later, our memory of that day is often romanticized, and there's still much up for debate. Were the Earp brothers truly noble lawmen who sought to tame the Wild West, or merely brutal vigilantes who committed a small-town massacre? <laughs> In the finale of our Wild West season, we will travel the thin line between hero and criminal in the most infamous shootout of the American West. I'm Jake Storielli, and this is the finale of this season of Last for My Ass. Welcome back to Laughs from the Past, Season 8, The Wild West. The shootout at the OK Corral is one of the more famous stories, so obviously we needed to cover mm. it. This is the season finale, and we are talking about Finale. the massacre mm. in Tombstone, mm. Arizona. I hate reliving this day. <laughs> um, this is a fantastic story. It's one of the best I've read uh, books, watched movies, and all that. Have you ever seen the movie Tombstone? This is just, I mean, years ago, like, I almost should just put it in the no bucket. Yeah. But, uh, man, the fact, and I don't know if we're already diving fully right in. Thanks for everyone who's been listening to this season. The fact that it takes place in Tombstone, I mean, I feel like that doesn't get enough love. Yeah. Like, Tombstone, Arizona. It is kind of wild, right? But that's that's how these stories put themselves together. That is. I'm trying to see if uh Well have to open up with this movie. Well. Listen to the dialogue here. It's the best. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your Huckleberry. That's all. Yeah. That's just all you need to know about the whole story. I'm your Huckleberry. I'm your Huckleberry. Val Kilmer, Val Kilmer mm. being Doc Holliday. I'm your Huckleberry. It's, I'm, uh, you know I'm a big Val Kilmer guy. Have you? And so you need to rewatch Tombstone. Yeah, I do. Yeah, watch, watch it here. Just watch mm -hmm. how he emerges, mm -hmm. and then we'll get into the story. Gotta have. Watch this. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your Huckleberry. It's just like it doesn't get more badass, cool. I love Val Kilmer. I'm your Huckleberry. I think there is like a a hint of irony when I say that, but that makes it better. Like Val Ki Kilmer's- I think you, you say it with irony right now, but then when you watch like a Val Kilmer movie, you're like, oh shit, like, I actually do love like, this. Like, no, thing. I actually, like that adds to it for me. Yeah. Okay. Like the fact that you walk away and it's like, it's not Christian Bale, it's not Leo. Like you're not getting that like, holy smokes, that's incredible acting. But the fact that it is good acting, yet you get that twist of like, all right. Tiny bit of Nick Cage. Hollywood. I'm your Huckleberry. Hollywood. Always up to no good. So anyway, Wyatt Earp is a cool guy. Yes. He's got some brothers. Morgan. Earp bros. Virgil. Earp gang. Is Raise it Vig Vigil? Virgil? This is a crazy story. I, re I recently read Dodge City by Clavin, which touches on this. And then he's got another book all about just this shootout, I believe, what I'm going to read soon. Is that Peter Clavin? I think it's Tom. Okay, Tom Glavin. Tom Clavin. I, I don't know if that's correct. Okay. Let's just get into the story. Thanks to producer Luke. I think he wrote this one. He's with us today. His internet feed looks... Looks like he's from 1999. Looks like he was taking an exasperated breath and got stuck there. Did you write this, Luke? Um, I pieced it and pieced it together from all the stories. Okay. You're going to have to you insert your own audio because you sound like a goblin. Eaten by an alien. So thank you, Luke. Change your Instagram profile picture. Not related, but 
I don't know. Mix it up today, Luke. You don't like it? Live a little bit. I don't know what it is. I'm just oh, telling okay. them to mix it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make some changes. No, you're fine. I kind of like it. We got you better now. Yeah. We, serious internet monster got you before. Yeah. Tombstone, Arizona. <laughs> the small historic town of Tombstone was founded by N. Shafflin in 1877 who was determined to prospect on Apache land despite warnings that all you find out there is your tombstone. Mm, schmoozer. Schmoozer almost leaked out on you there. That, maybe this audience doesn't even know who Schmoozer is, yeah. but uh, that's a badass reason for naming the town Tombstone. What should we name this place? Well, oh. there's a good chance we'll be killed, so let's name it after that. The only thing you'll find there is your own tombstone, pal. Well, how would I find that if I'm dead? We've got it down to murder or tombstone. So I die, someone sees me die, makes a nice tombstone, I come back to life and see it? It's a lot going on in that situation. Homicide? No, let's just do tombstone. Well, they don't know how you're going to die. Oh. It could just be, you know, old age, eventually. Maybe there's just actual rock that you make your tombstone out of. Everyone makes their own tombstone. You'll find it in tombstone. You think anyone's ever tried, like, Make your own tombstone. You know how you can go to pottery classes at Christmas time and make your own Christmas ornaments yeah. and put your initials? Like I'm going to say no. Just try to go to the old nursing homes and, and sell it. Like nursing home, nursing home. Like a make your own tombstone day. I'll say day. this. If I ever have like an endearing rock in my yard, like I think I'm going to try to have that rock be my tombstone. You, I think more people should do that. You just like... 60-year-old Jake just kicking around, sad, mo- Charlie Charlie Brown walking through like the woods. Like, I'm talking like Jess, a big Connecticut rock. Jess is you like, know what I'm talking Jess about. Jess is like, what are you looking for, Jake? Oh, just my thing of my tombstone rock. Your tombstone rock finds you, Jim. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, instead, Shefflin found a silver mine that eventually produced over $37 million in profits. Hey. Go back to the tombstone dude and be like, hey, idiot. Yeah. Wealthy merchants, in the hopes of cashing in on the mine, soon set up shop in Tombstone. By 1881, the town boasted fancy restaurants, a bowling alley, four churches, an ice house, a school, an opera house, two banks, three newspapers, and an ice cream parlor along with 110 saloons, 14 gambling halls, and numerous brothels all situated among a number of dirty, hard scrabble mines. The OK Corral was one of eight liveries, a place that keeps horses and vehicles for hire. Yeah. Livery. Livery? Livery. I think liveries. I don't know. You said it r- way too close to libraries. It sounded like it was a flex, like we've got eight libraries. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean to do it. It's okay. Uh, instead, the streets of Tombstone were flooded with cash, but they were also absent a lawman to maintain order. Because Tombstone was in Arizona, you know, like Dodge City was in Kansas, and that was like the frontier, sure. right? And before Dodge, it was uh, Laramie, I think. I don't know. And, uh, you know, those kind of got civilized along the way. And, you know, Wild Bill and, and, and Wyatt Earp got moved out because they were like, dude, we can't have gunslinging lawmen anymore. Like, right. we want more law and order and justice. So they just kept going west. Right. So Tombstone was like the last one that was like, you know, lawless. Ran into the ocean. No law on Tombstone. Yeah. Seems like a miss by Tombstone. Uh, by that time, you've seen enough places come along that like, hey, if you're, if you're going to do this with all the, what do they call them, wealthy merchants? Yeah. Maybe all the wealthy merchants should have been like, should we have lawmen in town? Yeah. A lot of people didn't, didn't want them. Law. The bustling frontier da- town attracted a dangerous crowd and became an easy target for rustlers and bandits. Tombstone was soon overrun with gambling houses, brothels, and violence. In Dece- yeah, yeah. In December 1879, the brothers James, Virgil, and Wyatt Earp, along with a gunslinging ex-dentist named Doc Holliday, mm. rolled into town to administer their own brand of justice. Boom. Yeah, Start you'd the movie. L- you'd love Doc Holliday. Oh, yeah. He was a dentist, and he got, uh, I don't know if it, Luke has it in here. Do you want me to stop? Do you have any background on Doc Holliday in this? No? Shagan said no. Okay, so Doc Holliday was a dentist, but then he got some sort of liver disease. Sure. Um, 
always had like a always was coughing up blood. Right. And once he found out he was gonna die early, he's like, "Fuck being a dentist." Might as well, yeah. Might as well live. So he just went, drank, and gambled, and coughed, and he was. Um, he was Wyatt Earp's friend that everyone else, like Bat Masterson, everyone else was like, Wyatt, why the fuck you bring Doc Holliday right. around? Like, he's, like, such a troublemaker. Like, and, he, and Wyatt's like, he's loyal to me, and right. I like having him around. That kind of vibe. Sure. You know? Everyone has, like, that friend, and it's like, dude, you can come, but him? don't bring him. Yeah. That was kind of Doc's vibe. Okay. The Earps take charge of Tombstone. Wyatt Earp was an ex-lawman of his hometown in Missouri. When his wife died, Earp wandered the West and got himself into some legal trouble. He eventually settled in Dodge City, Kansas, where he became the city marshal. In 1879, he set off with a new friend he'd made in Kansas, Doc Holliday, to Tombstone with his brothers. Though not universally liked by the townspeople, who is, you know, the Earps tended to protect the interests of the town's business owners and residents. In the old American Southwest, cowboy mm. referred to an outlaw or a member of a gang of hard-drinking cattle smugglers or horse thieves. In Tombstone, that crew was known as the Cochise County Cowboys. Cochise. Familiar territory for us. CCP. Yeah. CCC. You know, well, CCCP is the Russians. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good note by Got me. That. Yep. Noted. Just Write a note down. for everyone listening at home that wanted a little Russian. Across in the, the ocean, what was happening. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, what was I going to say? Do you know one in every four cowboys was a black American? Yeah. The white. I they, knew that. Yeah. They whitewashed the, the story of the cowboy. Hollywood did. There's a lot of uh, slaves that got free. And they're like, well... Cowboy. We're getting the fuck out of here. And yeah. They went west. So that's cool. The Cochise County Cowboys went from being a nuisance to the Earps brothers' mortal enemies. Big jump. That is a flip. It's like when a, a bee um, turns no. into a deadly bee. Nuisance to mortal. I guess so. Yeah, you were going to fight it, but <laughs> no, it's pretty good. No, it half works. <laughs> uh when one one of the members accidentally killed the city marshal, Fred White. That's what happened. It's an That's accident, it. Fred. In October 1880, Fred White and Wyatt Earp had been summoned to calm down a few drunk cowboys unloading their pistols into the night sky. White asked the men to surrender their weapons, and they complied. But a gun belonging to Curly Bill, Brocious, accidentally went off and shot White in the gut. Gut shot by Curly Bill. Mm-hmm. Damn. It was an accident. Even Fred White would insist as much while lying in his deathbed, as did Wyatt Earp, who defended Brocious on trial. But the death of Fred White saw Virgil Earp named the new city marshal in his steed. Interesting. And with that, a new era came to Tombstone. Yeah, the Earps went to Tombstone not to be lawmen. Right. They had, like, a billiards hall, I think, or they wanted to start, like, real business. Sure. And uh, a bro's bar. But Fred White gets shot, and then it's like, who do we turn to now? Fucking Curly Bill Brocious. Yeah. Curly Bill. I think he's a main, main player in this story. Mm. The lead up to the shootout. What name would you want most? Virgil, Morgan, or Wyatt? Dude, unbelievable. I... Passed up asking you that question when we were introduced to the Earp Brothers. And I was going to throw James in there because that's your real name. Yep. That's my birth name. Which I don't know if that brings bias or like reverse bias where you'd be like, well, no, I don't, I'm not in love with the name James, but you are. I mean, it's yeah, rain to I'd you. choose James over okay. Morgan White or You Virgil. have to. It's your human name. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm a big Virgil guy. I think life's tough for a lot of Virgils. Yeah, Virgil the Virgin seems obvious. That seems like that's going to be there for a while. And Morgan, I'm going Wyatt as my name, but it might be because he, you know, he's the most badass, so I think of it. But like, if I'm Virgil, I probably go Gil at some point. And I kind of put out Gil vibes. Yeah, Gil. Yeah, not a Gil you like. 
If your name How was Gil, Gil, if your name was Gil, you'd you'd have less friends. Gil's always got a joke, huh? You personally, yeah, yeah, that would be bad. Thank God your name's not Gil. Yeah, that's something. Well, under Virgil, it was illegal to carry any weapon within the town's limits. A law that gave the Earp brothers just cause to arrest about any cowboy they saw. Interesting. There's some reverse, uh, reverse politicking governing there. Oh, guns aren't legal here, so if you do have a gun, we're taking you down. That was how a lot of towns were mm. were uh, run, you know. No no guns. You got to holster them. Kind of know. a classic case. Yeah. You can still carry guns in Arizona. Yeah, a lot of states. Is it? I thought it was only like a five or less than five. Um, I was like Arizona, Texas. Gun carrying states. Yeah. I mean, I would have guessed like half the country. I mean, with permits and stuff. No, I'm not talking about with permits. Well, in Arizona, I think you can take a gun anywhere you want besides a bank. There's like three places. 31 states allow the open carrying of handgun without any license. 31. Shh. Damn. Delaware. How about that? Mm. Go, go blue hens. Uh, I forget where I was on the sheet. Here we go. So, meanwhile, the county sheriff, John Behan, did little to bring thieving cowboys to justice. This angered the Earps, especially Wyatt, mm. whose hopes to become county sheriff were dashed when Behan took the position. Wyatt Earp reasoned that he could gain some good publicity and a better shot at winning county sheriff if he could prove himself. He struck a deal with a rancher named Ike Clanton, mm. who was close with the Cowboys. You're seeing Ike soon. My, my uh, nephew's name is Ike. To bring the thieves to justice. So he strikes a deal with Ike, bring the thieves to justice. In return for his cooperation, Ert promised Clanton a $6,000 reward. That's a big one. That's a big reward. Yeah. The deal did not last long, and when it dissolved, Erp was again left in the lurch. It's the worst feeling. There's no way Luke wrote that line. When you're left in the lurch. Luke's a copy paster, and I appreciate that. Left but in when the I'm lurch. left in the lurch, I'm just like, oh, my God. God get me out of this <laughs> Get lurch. me out of the lurch, please. Ah, up to my neck and lurch the over lurch. here. Gross. What a tough word. Dry and wet all at the same time. Lurch. It's so bad. Ugh. On October 25th, 1881, Jake did not exist, and it was also mm. the day before the gunfight at the OK Corral. Lurch. Doc Holliday confronted Clan in a saloon. The men fought viciously, and later that day, Clanton tracked down Wyatt Earp and threatened him. That's a good sign of conv- a gunfight's coming. They knew this was coming. Yeah. Also, there's so much more buildup. I understand we're doing just like an hour show, so Luke couldn't write everything. Sure. But um, there was like so much tensions and all this shit, and this, this like gang of cowboys was a problem. Yeah. The day of the shootout. After Holiday's confrontation with Ike Clanton, Wyatt Earp took Holiday back to his room at Buckfly's lodging house to sleep off his drinking, then went home and to bed. Virgil Earp played poker with Ike Clanton. Tom McClory, Sheriff Johnny Behan in a back room. Oh, and Tom McClory and Sheriff Behan in the back room of the saloon until morning. Okay. At about dawn on October 26th, the card game broke up and Behan and Virgil Earp went home to bed. Not having rented a room, Tom McClory and Ike Clan had no place to go. Shortly after 8 a.m., the barkeeper, E.F. Boyle. Why didn't people sleep? They're drink drunkards. Just all night? It's hot in Arizona, man. Sleep during the day. It's true. Too hot to sleep. Yeah, during the day. Yeah, a couple different ways to go about it. I don't know. Like I don't don't get me wrong, I've had some some drinks drinks with the boys, stay up late, blah blah blah. Although that's never been our niche market, um, but God, staying up all night, Arizona, drinking, playing cards, hmm. till eight a.m. Like five a.m. hits, and you're like, good God. Four, three. Were they pumping in caffeine? Oh, yeah, they're drinking coffee, beer, okay. spirits. They're gambling, though, too. You got to remember. Caffeine. Gambling. Right. 
gambling. I mean, they're not pumping in oxygen, though. No. Definitely, definitely not. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, so, what do we got here? EF Boyle, barkeeper, comes in at 8 a.m. He speaks to Ike Clanton. Clanton had been drinking all night, and Boyle encouraged him to go get some sleep, but Ike insisted he would not go to bed. Mm. Boyle noticed Ike was armed and covered his gun for him. Okay. Mm. Okay, so EF Boyle being a bro. I guess, yeah. Okay, hey, you should get some sleep. Ah, fuck you, EF. Cover your, I'll cover your gun. Uh, I'll cover your you. gun for you. you know. Boyle later said that Ike told him, as soon as the Earps and Doc Holliday showed themselves on the street, the ball would open, that they would have to fight. Boyle went down to Wyatt Earp's house and told him that Ike Clanton had threatened that when Wyatt, his brothers, and Doc Holliday showed themselves on the street, mm. that the ball would open. Can we just say that? Yeah, double ball opening. Ike said in his testimony afterward that he remembered neither meeting Boyle nor making any such statements that day. Well, Ike, you were fucking hammered at 8 a.m. Okay. Like, you clearly were drunk as shit. I mean, drinking all night. And then 8 a.m., you're, you're a mixture of that sleep, and you definitely blacked out. Yeah. Definitely blacked out. Deputy, Deputy Marshal Andy Bronk. Andy Bronk. Andy Bronk. Also heard the talk around town. He woke Virgil, who listened, and went back to sleep. Yeah, Virgil was up drinking, too. Big time. Like, what, are you, what are you saying, Bronk? It's going to be a ball when you, yeah. you and your Virgil, brother. Virgil did the classic drunk, and then you hear what someone's saying, and you're like, oh, boy. That's saying when you and your brother step out into town, it's going to be a ball. Shut up, Bronk. It's time to go to bed. <laughs> it's bedtime. Uh, so later in the morning, Ike picked up his rifle and revolver from the West End Corral, where he had deposited his weapons and stabled his wagon after entering town. By noon that day, Ike was still drinking and once again armed. In violation of the city ordinance against carrying firearms in the city, he told anyone who would listen he was looking for Holiday or an ERP. That's pretty good. An ERP. That's when a uh, when a man has met met his wit's end. When you don't really care who it is. Give me any of these five people. I want one of them dead. Yeah. Just any. Doesn't matter. That's crazy. Would have been funny if he was friendly with like one ERP. Yeah. It's like, I don't care. I don't give a shit about Gil. Any other ERP. Who's Gil? Who the fuck is Gil? Virgil. Virgil. You're calling him Gil? You're calling him Gil now? Why? Yeah, he kind of is a Gil. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, an ERP. Um. At Fly's boarding house where Holiday and his wife, Mary Catherine Harani, mm. were sleeping, proprietor Mary Fly heard Clanton's threats and banged on Holiday's door. Fly told Harone, I Clanton was here looking for Doc, mm. and he had a rifle with him. She's from Jersey. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't know that. How about that? Mary uh, Catherine Harani. Obviously. Her Harani Har- I Clanton was here looking for you, Doc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Marissa Tomei in the movie. Yes. Doing yes, it. Yes. So. Haroni woke her husband and relayed the threat, who replied, If God will let me live to get my clothes on, he will see me. That's a good line. <laughs> That's a really good line. That's how you know it's fake. If God will let me live to get my clothes on. That's really good. Like two seconds, dude. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. The only thing that could happen yeah. is if I'm getting dressed and die today, which has never happened to the, in the history of the world, that would be the only to reason. To him. That'd it's be happened. The, that'd be the only reason I'm not making it to this gunfight. It's happened to people before. Sure. At about 1 p.m., Virgil and Deputy Morgan Irk found Ike on 4th Street, still armed, and Virgil pistol whipped him in from, from behind. So Ike Clan, like... You got to think, when you think shootout at the OK Corral, you think a bunch of badass dudes, like, going and, like, having a gunfight. Yeah. Ike Klan probably can't even fucking walk. He's drunk. <laughs> He's, like, drunk as shit. He's hammed. Like, imagine the most pathetic dude yeah. at the bar getting in a fight with the bouncer, screaming at everyone in line. That's Ike Klan exactly right now. That's exactly what it is. Um... So, I, I always lose my spot. Disarming him. The Earps took... He's drunk enough that 
the men he's promised to kill can come up behind him and pistol Just like, him. bam, you're done. So, disarming him, the Earps took, took Ike to appear before Justice of the Peace A.O. Wallace for violating the ordinance. Wyatt waited with Clanton while Virgil went to find Justice Wallace so a court hearing could be held. Instant, baby. While Wyatt waited for Virgil to, to return with Justice Wallace, witnesses overheard Wyatt tell Clanton, You cattle thieving son of a bitch. And you know that I know you are a cattle thieving son of a bitch. But you've threatened my life enough, and you've got to fight. Wyatt was cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's a... Uh... You cattle thieving son of a bitch, and you know that I know that you're a cattle thieving son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll fucking deny it, Ike. If I know you're probably gonna deny it, <laughs> but if I say it twice, there's no argument. Yeah. You've taken the argument away. Wyatt, Virgil, and Morgan offered him his rifle and to fight him right there in the courthouse, which Ike declined. No, guys. Yeah. yeah. No. Too drunk for that. Yeah. Ike also denied ever threatening the herbs. He's blackout drunk. No, see, right now I've got him on the downhill that he's just having a bad time. Like, he's he's been sobering up okay. for a little while. He was in the sun. He was in the streets. He got pistol whipped. Now he's in the courthouse. And now he's got three dudes screaming at him, we'll fight you right now. And he's like, no, just no. Yeah. Whatever I have to do to make this end. Yeah. All right. Mm, we're in a pickle with this car situation. Okay. Wyatt Virgil offered him there. He said, no, Justice Wallace fined Ike $25, mm. which is $660 in 2019. Gentleman's fine. Ike paid the fine, and Virgil told Ike that he could pick up his confiscated rifle and revolver at the Grand Hotel, which was favored by cowboys when in town. Ike picked up the weapons from the jailer a couple days later. McLaurie's Concealed Weapon Ooh, the first, name of the next chapter. Yeah, the first curveball. Outside the courthouse where Ike was being fined, Wyatt Earp walked into 28-year-old Tom McLaurie as the two men were brought up short nose to nose. What? Yeah. No, just say it again and it'll make sense to you. Wyatt Earp walked into 28-year-old Tom McClory as the two men were brought up short nose to nose. Yeah, they just yeah, yeah. they just got nose to nose. What's brought up short nose? They were brought up short nose to nose, man. <laughs> This is in each other's face is what we're saying. Tom, who arrived in town the day before, was required. <laughs> brought up short nose to nose is so weird. I think that's saying they essentially came face to face with Sans introduction. Like right away. Yeah. In a short time period. Like nose there was, nose. they had never met before and yeah. they were instantly nose to nose. Cool. When uh, white demand. Ooh, oh, it's getting good, Jake. Tom, who had arrived in town the day before, was required by the well-known city ordinance to deposit his pistol when he first arrived in town. When Wyatt demanded, are you healed or not? I wish that was more well-known because that would be a great, like, Conan O'Brien sketch. Are you healed or not? Like, we love the old-timey Conan O'Brien playing baseball sketch. If, if you haven't YouTubed, it's good for some, some good cheap Conan laughs if you're into that. But this would be... You know, Conan at a gun convention or something like that and being like, you healed? You healing? And they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, I don't, it's still like to heal is put by your side, right? So is your gun by your side? I think it's an old fashioned way of saying, do you have a gun on you? Are you armed? Yeah, yeah. McClary said he was not armed. Yet Wyatt saw a revolver in plain sight on the right hip of Tom's pants. Ooh. I love that. Not, you're a lying not son trying. of a bitch. And you know, I know that yeah. you know you're a lying son of a bitch. That's a, that's a power play. The gun showing and saying, Nah. I'm not armed. That's chocolate. You don't, you, if this comes out, you don't want to know what this is. It's a box of chocolate. Right now, I'm not armed. My son turns chocolate into a gun. I can change quick. Wyatt saw a revolver in plain sight of Tom's pants. Wyatt drew his revolver from his coat. <laughs> 
and pistol whipped Tom McCleary with it twice. <laughs> that was Wyatt Earp's move. Like, you know, Red in Dodge City with yeah. Tom Clavin. He was just always fucking pistol whipping people. Word. There was a name for it back then I can't think of. But whatever. Leaving him bleeding on the street. McClory later deposited his revolver at the Capitol Saloon sometime between 1 and 2 p.m. after the confrontation with Wyatt. Sure. Taught him. 1 to 2. Taught him. Wyatt went and bought a cigar before returning outside to watch the Cowboys. Also, side note. Yeah. I think if if this was more well-known, and OK Corral is pretty well-known, but if you wanted to... I don't know, sneak out of work and get a lunch beer with friends or maybe you were looking to day drink a little bit or something like that. If it was internationally known that 1 to 2 p.m. was like grabbing a McLaurie, you want to get a McLaurie later? Yeah. yeah. And it's just known, a drink from 1 to 2 p.m. We can make it happen. I'll try. I'll try to mix it in. Let's go get a McLaurie. You got to know what time it is. It's kind of hard. Yeah. Wyatt went and bought a cigar, and he went outside to watch the Cowboys. Not the football team. He just wanted to watch the, yeah. the Cowboys. Why not? At the time of the gunfight, about two hours later, Wyatt could not know if Tom was still armed. So that's what we're knowing. Gotcha. He doesn't know that Tom went and got his gun. It was early afternoon by the time Ike and Tom had seen doctors for their head wounds. Mm. The day was chilly. Oh. With snow still on the ground That's why they were in some drinking. places. That's why they were drinking. That's why they were drinking all night. Makes sense cold. now. Both Tom and Ike had spent the night gambling, drinking heavily, and without sleep. So now Ike's on two nights no sleep? Just nobody's sleeping. I don't get that. Well, this Ike... Is, this is the morning after. <clears throat> still. Same but day. This is the same as walking out of the courthouse. Everyone's without sleep. So one sleep. night. Oh, okay. Well, w- so, But still. So Tom was with them before? I thought Tom just got to town. When they walked out of the courthouse that from day. Ike, they ran into Tom. Who had just gotten to town? Continuous yeah. story. The day earlier. So he'd been there long enough to get rid of his weapons. We backtracked to get to Tom. Okay. All right, all right. So anyway, this is the night after the 8 a.m. drinking session. No, it's still during the day. Still during the day. After that. Okay, okay. Everyone's – so Ike's still hammered. Now they were both out, out of doors, both wounded from head beatings, and at least Ike was still drunk. Yes, yeah, of course he's still drunk. Cowboy backup. At around 1.30 to 2 p.m., a little late McClurry, yeah. Tom had been pistol whipped by Wyatt. After Tom had been pistol whipped by Wyatt, Ike's 19-year-old younger brother, Billy Clanton, and Tom's older brother, Frank McLaurie, arrived in town. Mm. They had heard from their neighbor, Ed, old man, Frank. Get <clears throat> out of here, Ed, old man, Frank. What does the old man in Tombstone have to do better than just, you know, It's being just alone? a gossip girl, man. Yeah. Screw that. I mean, you got to kind of love it. What is, he's going to sit back and watch. I do. That's why I enjoy Low <clears throat> Bosworth. Yeah. Old man. Uh, Stir it <clears throat> up. Told told him that Ike had been stirring up trouble in town overnight and they had ridden into town on horseback to back up their brothers. Both Frank and Billy were armed with a revolver and a rifle, as was the custom for riders in the country outside Tombstone. Apache warriors had endangered the U.S. Army near Tombstone just three weeks before the O.K. Corral gunfight, so the need for weapons outside of town was well established and accepted. Billy and Frank stopped first at the Grand Hotel on Allen Street and were greeted by Doc Holliday. Immediately after, they learned of their brother's beatings by the Earps, which had occurred within the previous hours. The incidents had generated a lot of talk in town. Angrily, Frank said he would not drink, and he and Billy left the saloon to seek Tom. By law, both Frank and Billy should have left their firearms at the Grand Hotel. Instead, they remained fully armed. Mm. That's uh, <clears throat> that's another good code for back in the day. Like, <clears throat> I won't be drinking. I got to be sharp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, what, that's almost it, code for more troubles coming. Oh, so he knows how drunk his brother is. Always. Well, yeah, After, not, I see the frost on the ground. I know what my brother was doing last yeah, night. yeah, yeah. yeah. Virgil and Wyatt Earp's reactions. 
Wyatt saw Billy Clanton and Frank McClory in Spangenberger's gun and hardware store. <clears throat> what a terror. Spangenberger? I like it. It's gross. Like painting that on a sign? Come on. Call it Spangs. Big sign. Well, he saw them at the hardware store filling their gun bounce with cartridges. Yet, what they didn't know is that the store owner had losing my voice. Mm. <clears throat> Yet, what? <clears throat> oh, you read. I got a cough, I guess. Okay. Yet, what they didn't know is that the store. Okay. Well, that's even. It's almost rude. Have some of your water. Yet what they didn't know is that the store owner had refused to sell Ike a revolver after seeing the fresh bandage on his head. Smart. Ike apparently had not heard Virgil tell him that his confiscated weapons were at the Grand Hotel. I mean, also, Ike's still drunk as shit. That's a hilarious gun owner rule, or gun shop rule. I mean, I saw you just, you're still bleeding out your head, boy. Yeah. I can't sell you this gun. What, do you yeah. think I'm dumb? You're hammered and bloody. You're bleeding out of your head. Not only will I not sell you the gun, I need you to leave the, the sign. St- I need you to leave the store. Sign out front. Will not sell guns if currently bleeding. Drunk as fuck. Just got hit in the head. Eh, drunk's a maybe. Okay. Um, when Virgil Earp learned that Wyatt was talking to the cowboys at the gun shop, he went there himself. Virgil said that he thought he saw all four men, Ike Clanton, Billy Clanton, Frank McClory, and Tom McClory, buying cartridges. Virgil went around the corner to the Wells Fargo office where he picked up a 12-gauge, short, double-barreled shotgun. Yep. It was an unusually cold and windy day in Tombstone, and Virgil was wearing a long overcoat. To avoid alarming Tombstone public, Virgil hid the shotgun under his overcoat when he returned to Hafford's saloon. It's classic. Badass. Yeah. The Cowboys moved to the OK Corral where witnesses overheard them threatening to kill the Earps. For unknown reasons, the Cowboys walked out the back of the OK Corral and then west, stopping in a narrow, empty lot next to C.S. Fly's boarding house. Virgil initially avoided a confrontation with the newly arrived Frank McClory and Billy Clanton, who had not yet deposited their weapons at a hotel or stable as the law required. The ordinance did not specify how far a recently arrived visitor was allowed to travel into town while carrying a firearm. Actually, Mm. travelers were able to keep their firearms if they proceeded directly to the livery Hotel mm. or saloon. Love a good loophole. You love a good loophole. Why saloon in there? <laughs> Got to get a drink first. Like it makes sense that it's like going on vacation. It makes and you're sense. Like first thing I need is a drink. I know, but like that makes sense, but not for an actual law. Not for this at all. Yeah, but seems like the opposite. Again, this is just people are dumb. This is Jake's theory of people being just <clears throat> optimally dumb. The further and further back you go. And it makes sense. I think it's more like no law. Like if they put it to a vote, everyone's like, I want to be able to go get a drink before I put my gun down. Yeah. And they all vote for that. Yeah, like one of Wyatt's friends came to visit him and he just wanted to start drinking right away. And he's like, well, we'll change the law. So yeah, I mean, it's the definition of politics. Yeah. The three main tombstone corrals were all a block or two from where Wyatt saw the Cowboys buying cartridges. Miner Reuben F. Ooh. Coleman. Hey, Reuben. Later said. He's a piece of history. Yeah. You want to read his quote? I I was in the OK Corral when I saw the two Clantons and the two McLaurie boys in an earnest conversation across the street at Dunbar's Corral. I went up the street and notified Sheriff Behan and told them it was, in my opinion, that they meant trouble. And it was his duty as sheriff to go down and disarm them. I then went and saw Marshal Virgil Earp and notified him to the same effect. Mm, okay. Snitch. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, come on. You live in the Wild West. Get over you it. You know who hates Reuben F. Coleman? Um, Old man. Everyone that dies. Old man. Yeah. Old man's trying to put this in motion, and Reuben F. Coleman's trying to, like, stop it. Yeah, old man's trying to set up his basically his TV show for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Reuben. 
Sheriff Johnny Behan, a friend of the Cowboys, woke up about 1.30 p.m. after the late night card game and went to get a shave at a barbershop. Woke up at 1.30. It's, there we go. That's a sheriff. Times were just different. Well, when they're drinking until 8 a.m., the sheriff's yeah, got to be true. up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's where he first learned that the Cowboys were armed. Bean quickly finished his shave and went to locate the Cowboys. He found Frank McClory holding a horse near the corner of Fremont. When he saw Ike Clanton and Tom McClary near Fly's photography studio, he... Who's this Fly dude? Fly owns everything? Fly's doing well. He walked there with Frank. He told the Cowboys that they must give up their arms. Oh, my God. (laughs) Too easy. Ike Klan said he was not armed. Don't have any. Yeah. And Tom McClurry pulled his coat open to show he was not carrying a weapon. But Tom was carrying a weapon. Yeah. The Cowboys were located in a narrow 15 to 20 foot alley between the Hardwood House and Fly's 12 room boarding. 15 to 20 feet is tiny, man. 15 to 20 feet. Yeah. This is like basketball hoop and a half. Yeah. Yeah. That's tiny. It's tiny. It's an alleyway. Yeah. No idea where I was. Sure. Oh. Uh, Doc Holliday, it was where Doc Holliday roomed. Cool. Behan attempted to persuade Frank McClory to give up his weapons, but Frank insisted that he would give up his guns only after City Marshal Virgil Earp and his brothers were disarmed first. Hmm. Ike Klan said he was planning to leave town. He's like getting, he's starting to be so uh, hungover. Yeah. Miserable. Frank McClory reported that he had decided to remain behind to take care of some business. Mm. Yeah, that Ike Klan <clears throat> planning to leave town is actually, that's pretty good. That's, uh, that's the hungover theory before that I was talking about. Like, the herbs get in his face. <clears throat> he wanted to, he was telling them he wanted to kill any of them hours ago. Then he's coming down. He's in court. He's just like, please let this end. Wasn't he playing with Gil all night? And now a couple hours later, he's saying like, I will literally get out of town if we could just stop this right now. Luke, didn't the story start with Gil playing cards with Ike? Always is. Yeah, so I think Wyatt and um, Ike had beef, but then Virgil, the sheriff, him and Tom were all playing poker. So now it seems like something had to happen in that poker game for Ike to be like any Earp. I want a, I want them all. And he was drunk. Okay. Like that. Citizens reported to Virgil on the Cowboys' movements, and their threats told him that Ike and Tom had left their library stable and entered town while armed, in violation of the city ordinance. Virgil decided he had to disarm the Cowboys. His decision to take action may have been influenced by the Cowboys' repeated threats to the Earps, their proximity to Holiday's room in Fly's boarding house, and their location on the route the Earps usually took to their homes. The old perfect storm is what they're trying to set so up. So those guys that want to kill us currently have guns on them, and we have to ride past them and at night. Everywhere we go. Yeah. I think that's good yeah. enough reason to be like, hey, let's get the guns out of their hands. Several members of the Citizens Vigilance Committee, awesome, offered to support him with arms, but Virgil refused. He had, during the prior month, appointed Morgan and Wyatt as a special policeman. Sure. He also called on Doc Holliday that morning for help with disarming the Klan and McClory's. So he's deputizing everyone. The Earps and Holliday walked out of visual range of the Cowboys' last reported location. The Earps ran into Sheriff Behan. He had left the Cowboys and came toward them though he looked nervously backwards several times. What a detail. Mm -hmm. Virgil testified afterward that Behan told them, for God's sake, don't go down there or they will murder you. Wyatt said Behan told Tim and Morgan, I have disarmed them. Behan testified afterward that he'd only said he'd gone down to the Cowboys for the purpose of disarming them, not that he'd actually disarmed them. Ooh, a little miscommunication. Yeah, he was bullshitting the Wyatt. Wyatt's the big bad Big bad deputy from back in the day, you know? 
So he's just bullshitting to him. So, Deputy Beham, you got boys walking around your town with weapons when that's against the law? No, No, I I just went down there to disarm them. disarm those boys, but I don't want you causing trouble. Yeah. 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 And disarm shit. Yeah. Mm. Whatever the truth may be, Virgil Earp picked up the shotgun he had retrieved from the Wells Fargo office earlier. He gave the shotgun to Doc Holliday, who hid it under his overcoat. Classic. He took Holiday's walking stick in return. Good trade. Is it? For one side. <laughs> but now Doc can't walk. Yeah, I mean, you know, Doc uses his walking stick for survival. He can still turn it on. It's like an okay. old guy playing basketball. You know, he's 42. You can't just gas it all day. Yeah, but okay. if you need a bucket. Mm-hmm. The Earps walked further down Fremont Street and came into full view of the Cowboys in the lot. Wyatt saw Frank McLaurie, Tom McLaurie, Billy. I'm sick of saying all their names. Yeah. Wyatt saw Frank, Tom, and Billy standing in a row against the east side of the building. Ike and Billy Claiborne ah, new Billy. and Wes Fuller were standing in the adjacent vacant space. When the Cowboys saw the officers, they stepped away from the hardwood house. Yeah, I mean, I'm starting to not like how big of a story this is. Like, we've got every detail, yeah. and I almost don't need it. Like, I'm kind of over the fact that Billy Claiborne and Wes Fuller are standing in the adjacent space. Kind of don't care. I think they play big into the shooting, but it is funny if, you're, if like, they're attached to this forever, but they were just, like, some person in the alleyway. Right. Like, Wait, I what's mean, going on, guys? We've got the whole police diagram and everything at this point, and it's like, It, it goes into how big the story is. No other Wild West thing is there this much detail yeah. available. Right, and that's like, kind that's of the... That's how much has been retold. Isn't there something else like that? Like, something, something in history that gets discovered that's talked about a lot? Well, I guess that's a lot of things in history that, like... Well, this was preserved, so we just talk about this. King Tut. Yeah, yeah. King Tut is, like, not important in Egyptian history, but he's important he's in our him. history because the tomb remained and we could. We did a whole episode so well. on him, right? <laughs> we did a whole episode on him, right? I think we did. Yeah, I think we did, too. Children in history. Funky Tut. The gun battle begins. Virgil Earp was not expecting a fight. He gave his gun away. Yeah. We traded it for a walking, walking stick, stick when he can walk. Once Behan said he'd disarmed the Cowboys, Virgil traded the short double-barreled shotgun he was carrying for Holiday's cane. Yep. Virgil carried the cane in his right hand and shifted the pistol in his waistband from the right side to his left. Holiday, is he a lefty? Because now his gun's in his off hand. I'm, I'm thinking it's from the side, like you'd expect it to be on his right side. Okay. No, that's the point. He wasn't expecting a fight, so he put it from his oh, armed okay. hand to his opposite side. Yeah, he's offhand. Yeah, that's all. So, um, Holiday concealed the short shotgun under his long jacket. Wyatt, too, was not expecting a fight, so he put his pistol in his overcoat pocket. Billy Clanton and Frank McClory wore revolvers in holsters on their belts and stood alongside their saddled horses with rifles in their scabbards. Mm. When Virgil saw the Cowboys, he immediately commanded the Cowboys to throw up your hands, I want your guns. Yeah. But Frank McClory and Billy Clanton drew and cocked their revolvers. Virgil yelled, oh, hold on. I don't want that. It's bad. Opposite of what I wanted. It's bad. Who started shooting first is not certain. Accounts by both participants and eyewitnesses are contradictory. It's every good story is. The smoke from the black powder used in the weapons added to the confusion of the gunfight in the narrow space. The six or seven men with guns fired about 30 shots in 30 seconds. You do you do 15, and I'll do 15 in in 30 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. I didn't count. I didn't either. Okay. I counted up to six, and I was like, that. I don't want to yeah. do this anymore. That's what it sounded like, though, probably. So we've got six or seven men, 30 shots, 30 seconds. Were you shooting all in the same place the whole time? Yeah. Okay. So five per person, five just a every huge, five seconds. Huge hole in the wall. I guess it's impressive at the time. This guy just yeah. shot the wall the same spot <laughs> ten times. Just, <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> you had something? <laughs> Someone's on horse, right? 
They're like standing beside their horses. Saddled horses, yeah. I, I mean, I just had a really dead horse. <laughs> you, sh- you shot the horse eight times. What the hell were you doing? I thought it was Doc. Hated that horse. Um, uh, all witnesses generally, generally agreed that the first two shots were almost indistinguishable from each other. Sure. Virgil Earp agreed that the first two shots went off together and claimed Billy Clanton was responsible for one of them. Billy aimed his pistol at Virgil, but Virgil didn't aim it back at Billy. Instead, he aimed mm. at Frank McClory. He knew that Frank had a reputation as a good shot and a dangerous man, thus he was the initial target. Clanton missed, but Earp shot Frank McClory in the stomach. They're all like seven feet away. Brutal that- for Frank, man. Yeah. It's brutal. Well, that's what happens when you're the best shot. Yeah. It's like yeah. dodgeball, man. They're going to put the best defender on you. Yeah. After these first rounds, general firing immediately broke out. When the shooting started, the horse that Tom McClory held jumped to one side. Virgil said Tom followed the horse's movements, moving behind it, and fired once or twice over the horse's back. Horse shield. Holiday stepped around Tom McClory's horse and shot him with a double-barreled shotgun in the chest at close range. Oh. <laughs> That's tough. Tom fell at the foot of a telegraph pole and lay there without moving. Through the duration of the fight, after shooting Tom, Holiday tossed the empty shotgun aside, pulled out his nickel-plated revolver, and continued to fire at Frank and Billy. I mean, you know, I know before we were kind of depicting Doc Holiday as kind of the... The loser extra friend. Why do you roll with this guy? And this is exactly why. This is exactly why you have a friend like him in the Wild West. Double barrel. I'm going to go around the horse and shoot you. Done with the shotgun. Now let me pull out my nickel-plated revolver and keep fighting. Yeah. Like he's a ride or die. Oh, yeah. He's the best. Um, when the gunfight broke out, Ike Clanton, who had been publicly threatening to kill the Earps for several months, was also drunk as a skunk and bleeding from the head, ran forward and grabbed Wyatt, exclaiming that he was unarmed and did not want to fight. Wyatt responded, go to fighting or get away. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, we're in a fucking gunfight, Ike. We're doing this or we're not doing it. Clanton ran through the front door of Fly's boarding house and escaped, unwounded. (laughs) Ha ha. What a day. Like, when he sobers up, he's going to be like, wait, what happened? It's a full one. What? Thank God I ran away, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Like Ike, Billy Claiborne was unarmed. Yeah, I mean, he was just wrong place, wrong time, it seems. He and Cowboy West Fuller also ran from the fight as soon as the shooting began. We didn't need to meet them. So we didn't need them in the story. We did not need to meet them. They were there. Ever. Wyatt Earp stood up and fired in rapid succession. Bam, bam, boom, bang, boom, as cool as a cucumber, and was not hit. Wyatt Earp fired almost immediately. As Billy Clanton drew his gun right-handed, Morgan shot hit Billy in the right wrist, disabling his hand. Forced to shift the revolver to his left hand, Clanton continued shooting until he emptied the gun. Virgil and Wyatt were now firing. Morgan Earp tripped and fell over a newly buried water line uh. and fired from the ground. Oh. What? <laughs> yeah, it so- well, it sounded like sad at first. Like, oh, yeah, Morgan, who I think. Okay, no, Morgan shot, hit Billy in the wrist, so that's fine. But Morgan trips over a newly buried water line, which I was like, that sucks. I guess it wasn't very buried. I mean, well, the other thing, I mean, this is one of the biggest... You know, well-known shootouts in history. This is a Super Bowl of shootouts, and Morgan's current claim is that he tripped and fell. And I felt pretty bad for him right there, like that's someone tripping in the big game. Yeah. But, you know, some people trip and fall. Some people trip and turn into a beautiful dance move. He's shooting from the ground now. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, those are militaristic tactics. Good for him. Yep. Frank, who had been shot in the stomach, took his horse by its reins and struggled across Fremont Street. He tried and failed to grab his rifle from the scabbard, but lost control of the horse. Mm -hmm. Frank crossed Fremont Street, firing his revolver instead. Frank and Holiday exchanged shots as Frank moved across Fremont Street, and Frank hit Holiday in his pistol pocket, grazing him. 
Mm. Holiday followed him, exclaiming, That son of a bitch has shot me and I am going to kill him. Straightforward. I mean, who wrote the dialogue for this shit? That's what he said. Yeah. Morgan Earp picked himself up and also fired at Frank. Frank finally fell to the sidewalk. Though wounded, Billy Clanton and Frank McClory kept shooting. One of them shot Morgan Earp across the across the back in a wound that struck both shoulder blades and a vertebrae. Morgan went down for a minute before picking himself up. Either Frank or Billy shot Virgil Earp in the calf. Virgil, though hit, fired his neck shot at Billy Clanton. Frank, now entering across Fremont Street and still walk. Dude, there's no... All right, I'm getting frustrated. Yeah. Frank, now entirely across Fremont Street and still walking at a good pace, fired twice, more before he was shot in the head under his right ear. Both Morgan and Holiday apparently thought they had been fired and the shot to killed Frank. All right, here's what's pissing me off, Jake. Please. If this was... Think of how fast this happened. They yes. literally said 30 seconds. I think we left the 30 seconds, no? I think this is the post game. No, I think this is the 30 seconds. Luke? Mr. Luke? I think this is the 30 seconds. I think he got shot in the hand, switched his guns, tried to hang on to the back of the horse. They kept shooting him. He fell, and then he and then he shot from across the street after he fell off the short horse. Yeah, so this is the 30 seconds. Like, as far as I know, after the 30 seconds, everyone kind of went away. So, to get this much detail, you'd have to have a professional sports broadcast with replay cameras. Well, that's what I'm saying. Tracking, that's, like, everyone's move and like, being like, oh, that happened, then this happened. Oh, look, this, like, it's, like, it's like they have a breakdown on this. Like, there's no way they remember Well, this. I mean, A, that ties in perfectly to the King Tut theory that that's why this is so documented. It's because we have all this detail. And, yeah, I mean, either I'm either saying this is after the 30 seconds or the 30 seconds has now been exaggerated because there's too much. Since too when, much has happened. Yeah. I mean, But also, as what, you guys will see, there's a big trial where they get – so much information from everybody afterwards that whether this is right or wrong, that's where it's all coming from is a trial where they have all these witnesses. Yeah, but still, there's just too much info. King Tut. Billy Klein was shot in the wrist, chest, and abdomen, and after a minute or two, slumped to a sitting position near the corner of the hardwood store. Claiborne said Klein was supported by a window initially after he was shot and fired some shots after sitting, with the pistol supported on his leg. Sad scene. After he ran out of ammunition, he called for more cartridges, but C.S. Fly took his pistol at about the time the general shooting ended. Like, that's so sad. C.S. Fly just walked up and casually took his gun from him. Like, nah, I think you're good here, man. The, uh, the shooting did just end. Otherwise, I mean, it's a hilarious scene, but I love C.S. Fly. Clean it up. Uh, this you're is done. Good. You're good. This is over. I've seen a few of these. This is over yeah, now. Yeah, you bleed out. See ya. A few moments later, Tom McClory was carried into the hardwood house on the corner where he died without speaking. What? That's a weird detail. Mm. Passerby, a passerby carried Billy Clan to the hardwood house where Tom had been taken. Billy was in considerable pain and asked for a doctor and some morphine. He told those near him, They have murdered me. Mm. I have been murdered. Chased the crowd away and from the door and give me air. <laughs> Go away and let me die. So he died. Didn't like that. I'm sorry, just being honest. Acting. Honesty wins. It's just really good acting. Nope. Tom McClory, his brother Frank, and Billy Clan all died that day. Those sporting gunshot wounds, the Earp brothers, and Doc Holliday all lived to see another day. Didn't Morgan get shot in, like, the spine? Yeah, there was a... Morgan's, I'm, we skipped over, and I think it was good reason, because it, it said it hit him in both shoulder blades and the spine. Which, I mean, was he hit with a, like, two-foot-long bullet? Like, what bow was and that? arrow? Maybe it was a bow and arrow. So, yeah, we skimmed past that, and I'm glad. As the wounded lawmen were carried to their homes, they passed in front of the sheriff's office, and Sheriff Behan told Wyatt Earp that he would have to arrest him. Wyatt paused and replied very forcibly, I won't be arrested today. I am right here and am not going away. You have deceived me. 
You told me these men were unarmed. Mm. I went to disarm them. Well, that's kind of a contradiction. That is a contradiction. Wyatt, if you if you thought they were disarmed, you wouldn't go to disarm them. Yeah. No, that's that's true. Unless he's saying I, you told me they were disarmed. I found out they weren't, so then I had to go disarm them. Right, but then it, you'd phrase that differently. Yeah, could just be bad phrasing. Four days after the shootout, Ike Klan filed murder charges against Doc Holliday and the Earps. Wyatt and Holliday were arrested and brought before Justice of the Peace Wells Spicer. Wells Spicer, that's mm. a good name. Morgan and Virgil were still recovering at home. Only Wyatt and Holiday were required to post ten thousand dollar bail, which is two hundred and sixty grand in twenty nineteen. Yeah, that's big money. Um, Paid by their attorney, Tommy Fitch. Where to go, Fitch? And local mine owner E. B. Gage. And Wells Fargo. Oh, okay, so we got a agent, We've got a collection here. Fred Dodge and other business owners appreciative of the Earp's effort to maintain order. So the the town that liked the Earps. Yeah, the big them. the big wigs backed him up. Gill was suspended as town marshal pending the outcome of the trial. We have a picture of the dead bodies here. Yeah. Not too into it. It's not great. Spicer took written and oral testimony from a number of witnesses over more than a month. Accounts by both participants and eyewitnesses were contradictory. Those loyal to one side or the other told conflicting stories and independent eyewitnesses who did not know the participants by sight were unable to say certain who shot first. I mean, it's 30 seconds gunshot. No one's staring with binoculars taking notes. Everyone's just running and hiding. Yeah, I mean. Like, no one's even really watching. Must have been pretty. You don't think anybody was watching? Because I know you know one person. Old man, watching. but they didn't even ask him. Yeah, uh, yeah man, that's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, had to be pretty hilarious just seeing clearly the people that were friends with the Earps being like, oh. You should have seen it. The Earp Boys were out there. Glorious. I, I think they gave flowers to the women of the town. Mm-hmm. And then a dark cloud came over. Yeah. Two Good dogs got involved. There's a couple dogs. And the Earp saved them dogs' life. We'd love to know the, ri- the ridiculous details that came in. Yeah. Probably somewhere, maybe. Saw a blue jay. Sheriff Johnny Behan testified on the third day of the hearing. During two days on the stand, he gave strong testimony that the Cowboys had not resisted and instead threw up their hands and turned out their coats to show they were not armed. Behan's views turned public opinion against the Earps. What's Johnny Behan doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Maybe he's telling the truth, man. He and other witnesses testified that Tom McClory was unarmed, that Billy Klan had his hands in the air, and that neither of the McClurys were troublemakers. They portrayed Ike Clanton and Tom McClurys as being unjustly bullied and beaten by the vengeful Earps on the day of the gunfight. On the strength of the prosecution case, Spicer revoked the bail for Doc and Wyatt and had them jailed. Mm. I think so. Behan seems like he's he doesn't want people to think he's a bad sheriff. Like, I did disarm them. Yeah. And maybe it's a power grab by Behan. You know, he's the sheriff. Maybe he doesn't want the Earps having all this power. Yeah, he saw them get bailed out. He's like, fuck that. Yeah. They're coming for me. This is my town now. After hearing all the evidence, Justice Spicer ruled that Virgil, as the lawman in charge that day, there was not enough evidence to indict the men. That's not a proper sentence. He described Frank McClory's insistence that he would not give up his weapons unless the marshal and his deputies also gave up their arms as a proposition both monstrous and startling. He noted that the prosecution claimed that the Cowboys' purpose was to leave town, yet Ike and Billy did not have their weapons with them. Spicer noted that the doctor who examined the dead Cowboys established that the wounds they received could not have occurred if their hands and arms had been in the positions that prosecution witnesses described. Some early CSI stuff there. Spicer did not condone all of Earp's actions and criticized Virgil Earp's use of Wyatt and Holiday as deputies, but he concluded that no laws were broken. (laughs) He said the evidence indicated that the Earps and the Holidays acted within the law and that Holiday and Wyatt had been properly deputized by Virgil Earp. Whether Judge Spicer was right or wrong remains in debate today. But the gunfight at the OK Corral was not to be forgotten. Um, 
It was just the start of what would be one of the most brutal chapters in the history of the American frontier. It's funny because I'm sure there's bigger gunfights and shit like that, you know. King Tut. It's fully tutted. Hold up. Billy Clanton was only 19 years old? Mm. I guess he was the younger brother of Ike. And Tom McClory was 28. And Frank was 33. They were Their funerals were well attended. 300 people joined in the procession and as many as 2,000 watched from the sidewalks. Both McClory's were buried in the same grave and Billy Clanton was buried nearby. The story was widely printed in newspapers across the United States. Most versions favored the lawmen. The headline in the San Francisco exchange was a good riddance. Mm. Ike Clanton's revenge. Shortly after the verdict of the trial of the OK Corral gunfight, a cowboy fired a shotgun through the glass door of a saloon and into Virgil Earp's back. Virgil survived, but his, but his brother Morgan was later not so lucky. In the midst of a game of pool, the Earp brother was fatally shot in the back in a second assassination plot to be orchestrated by none other than Ike Clanton. Yeah, heads up. Wyatt Earp responded with a rampage of his own, which ended in a warrant for his and Holiday's arrest. The two men fled Tombstone, and Earp would spend the remainder of his days wandering the West, eventually settling in California, where he died at the age of 80 yeah. in 1929. Good for you, Wyatt. I mean, the revenge is just one line in our story because we're, we're you know, just doing the shootout, right. but his revenge ride and the, the, the posse he put together to track down the clans and stuff, pretty cool. There could be a whole episode. It's, it's called the Earp Vendetta. The Earp Vendetta, but they had a name. The Vendetta Ride. I thought there was yeah, a better name for it. Yeah, something like that. Earp's Vendetta to go get Clanton after he killed both of his brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Got him. Anyway. The gunfight at the OK Corral remains an infamous moment in American history. The event perfectly represented the gray area of justice that was a part of the Wild West as the shootout was both divisive and controversial with no real winner on each side. Yeah, man. That's... um. And obvious, this isn't a direct good Jakey comparison, and they rarely are, but I'm almost getting, like, O.J. Simpson vibes from this. Like, O.J. Simpson was kind of a perfect storm where he was a celebrity. I mean, there were some racial wars going on. Uh, TV had hit, like, a new point of TV where, like, everyone was tracking it. I feel like we've kind of got something there. Like, we've got newspapers around the country doing this like this is kind of the last mm -hmm. western town like we were talking about and there's no there's no final right or wrong answer which makes the conversation continuous mm -hmm. you know you could pick sides on this all day um and yeah i think that's what makes it the okay corral Wyatt Earp drew a map of the shooting and it's so hard to figure out. <laughs> That's tough. I'm not picturing Wyatt Earp as a big... Well, he's like 70 years old. Map artist. This is it. Mm. This looks like one of my drawings. Yeah, yeah. This is 4th Street. This is 3rd Street. There's the OK Corral. Mm. And <laughs> this is where the fight happens. It's a tough drawing. Fremont Street right here. For most people, this would be like your third grade drawing for me and Wyatt Earp. It's our mm -hmm. life. Yes. It's our livelihood. Wyatt Earp's pretty cool, but I think he definitely like had a mean side to him. Like he hit guys over the head. He just knock them out. Right. Ike, Ike Klein's kind of like, I mean, he just got drunk and caused a lot of shit. And he ran away. He's the big loser to me for this. <clears throat> Say it again. He's the big loser to me in this. Kinda. Yeah. He got his 19 year old brother killed and then ran away and laughed. Then he kills his some brother. Came to back him up because he was running around drunk, causing trouble. Yeah. Here, here, Jake. Let's watch. Who's the winner? I mean, I I know we normally do this, but no one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I. I feel like it's almost unfair to call I Cl Clanton the loser in this when I think like everyone is. Uh, I think there's no winner. He's the loser. Maybe Doc Holliday winner. Yeah, let's watch this together real Doc quick. Doc might they win. Can, people can listen. Sure. It's two minutes. It's like a minute or so. It's the the scene from the movie. 
Doc Holliday whistling. Whistling. Waving to the people as they head. That's Wyatt. How the hell mm. we get ourselves into this? That's Virgil. Ooh, Sam. You don't have to worry about a thing. I just went over there and disarmed. You did? Come on, go with it. Gentlemen, I'm not going to let Put it in his pocket. Oh, he's going to switch his gun? No? I thought nope. he was going to do that. That was just a little magic trick. Just taking a photograph? Oh, because it's right by the photographer's okay, center. Okay, corral. Guy dumping his head in a bucket of water. I think that's Ike. Getting sobered up. See, this is way bigger than what it actually was. Right. 20 feet. Oh, not what I want. <laughs> okay, they're all got their guns drawn. We had the one guy run away. That was Ike, right? Or Wes. Wes? Fuller. Oh, my God. Fuck Wes Fuller. I think that's Ike. There's Doc. Yeah. Nervous. A lot of close face shots. Everyone's nervous. That was Morgan. Mm. A <laughs> wink. We got a wink. Oh, oh my no. God. Oh, man. Shootout. Just a bunch of chefs. Oh, hiding behind a horse. The horse. Oh, great move by Doc. Ooh. Yeah. See, that's Ike. Ike, come in. Get the fighting or get away. Get to fighting or getting away. Wow. Shut the door. Is that supposed to be the spine shot? Oh, mm. shit. They lit him up. Doc really turned it on. Is that Ike? Because I don't think that happened. You know what I'm thinking, Jake? Sure. All the dialogue being the same as what we read. Wouldn't it be funny? Like, what we read was based on the movie instead of the movie being based on what yeah. we read. <laughs> Jimmy, I can't see what you're seeing, but did it look like Ike was shooting? Ike was shooting through a window, it seemed. That was something I read, too, that he had a concealed gun. And after he ran away, he took a couple shots from inside the house. Jeez, that scene's not in what we read. No. That's another really good Val Kilmer line. Yeah. You hear this one? They always are. <laughs> he goes, I got you now, you son of a bitch. And Val Kilmer goes, you a daisy if you do. Mm. I'm your Huckleberry. Good movie. You don't have to tell me about Val. Uh, I'm your Huckleberry. Good movie. Crazy shootout. I, again, like what we're saying, it's the King Tut. Like it's, we know about it because it was written about. I don't, I bet there was much, there's much crazier stories in this. I think so. I mean, actually, I think, I wouldn't say much crazier. I think this is kind of the standard though. I mean, if you think about all of the things we've heard, whether it's, you know, the different robbers or kind of gangs of their times, it's usually like a group of brothers. And along the way, they run into another group, and that group fights, and mm -hmm. then the next one advances. Yeah. And, like, your lore builds. So I'm sure, like you're saying, this is probably the standard King Tut. Wyatt Earp's also, like, his story and Doc Holliday's stories were bigger than this one fight. But sure. so, so because the characters were already names for themselves, I think that helped it grow it. immediately yeah. as well. Well... There you have it. The shootout at the Uke Corral. Tombstone, Arizona. Only thing you'll find there is your tombstone, partner. And a lot of silver. <laughs> you probably get it's rich. A ton of money if you want that. All right. See you guys. Thank you.